several years ago, I was giving a talk in Toronto, and I began by confessing to a prejudice. I said my prejudice was that I liked Canada <laughs> and Canadians. I then commented that a teenage, then teenage son of mine said he had a prejudice against Finchley, Finchley being a suburb of North London. And I asked him, why have you got a prejudice against Finchley? And he said, I told you, Dad, it's a prejudice. I don't have to have a reason. <laughs> so I don't have to have a reason for my prejudice in favor of Canada and Canadians. But given that I have evidence for everything I do, <laughs> if I needed evidence, it's what happened this afternoon. You've heard many people say that when we began the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, I said we wanted to create a social movement. And in my view, we had evidence of that social movement this afternoon. My heart is full. Every time I heard somebody say social determinants of health, I said, we're getting there. <laughs> and then the minister, Jane, talked about social determinants of health. I think the words she said was, they're used not infrequently around the cabinet table. <laughs> Frequently in the Ministry of Health, but not infrequently around the cabinet table. I used to quote a Minister of Foreign Affairs from Norway who said, I am a health minister. Every minister is a health minister because what we do in our day job impacts on health. And I used to go around the world quoting him, and I got a phone call from the Ministry of Health in Norway. And this colleague said, you know you've been quoting our Minister of Foreign Affairs. He now is our health minister. <laughs> and he wants to meet you. So I went to Oslo to meet him and we had a little mutual love in. I told him I'd been <laughs> quoting him around the world. And he said he went to a province, I can't pronounce the name, in southern Norway, and he met people from local government. And they said, our plans have been Marmot certified. <laughs> wow, I'd never even heard of the place, but they've been Marmot certified. I've heard so much good stuff today on social determinants of health that I don't think I can tell you anything. So I'm going to read from my new book. <laughs> and I'm going to start with chapter 8. In May 2011, Mary hanged herself. She was found in the yard of her grandparents' house on a First Nations reserve in the province of British Columbia in Canada. She was 14. She was a First Nations Aboriginal Canadian. Her story has particulars, all suicides do. She'd been physically and emotionally abused at home and in her community and possibly sexually abused. Her mother was mentally unstable and heard voices. Officials attributed the suicide to a dysfunctional child welfare system and to the fact that no one took her complaints of abuse seriously or acted on them. And certainly Cindy Blackstock in her keynote address earlier today gave a powerful and very moving testament to the dysfunctions in the system. There is another way to look at Mary's sadly foreshortened life. And that is to realize that though her personal tragedy was unique, there are, as you know, many young Aboriginal Canadians who experience similar tragedies. In fact, the Aboriginal youth suicide rate in British Columbia is five times the average for all young Canadians. 
one, uh, one cannot understand fully why Mary saw no way out without also asking why so many other young Aboriginal people in British Columbia reached the same desperate point. This audience knows about Mary. Question is, what do we do? I feel humble bringing this example to this audience. You know much more about this issue than I do. The researchers who studied this over a 20-year period pointed out that there were 200 bands of Aboriginal Canadians in British Columbia. In the first six years, 90% of the suicides occurred in 12% of the bands. They were not equally distributed. The key difference in my language was empowerment. What Chandler and Lalonde, the researchers who studied it, looked at was the degree of community participation in land grants, whether the communities controlled health services, education, other social services, cultural continuity. And they had six measures. The greater the community empowerment, the greater the number of, out of six of these measures present the lower the youth suicide, as we can see from these data, Chandler and Lalonde. Poverty is key, to echo a discussion from earlier today. Poverty is key. But all of these bands were in what Chandler and Lalonde called bone-grinding poverty. The difference was empowerment. I was about to give a talk about my book in the US last year, and I'd written about Baltimore. And a few weeks before I was giving this lecture at Harvard, Baltimore erupted. The precipitant of the eruption was the killing of a black man in police custody, or should I say the killing of one more black man in police custody. That was the precipitant. But the underlying cause was inequality. Because when I say Baltimore erupted, I'm being slightly inaccurate. It was one part of Baltimore that erupted. In Upton Druid, in the deprived downtown, was where the riots happened. And I'd written about LaShawn and Bobby, Bobby growing up in Greater Roland Park. The life expectancy gap was 20 years for men. And the riots happened, of course, in the deprived area. When we had the summer riots in London in 2011, they broke out in Tottenham. One of my sons has moved into Tottenham. Um, the, uh, the older son, the previous urban riots in London were in Brixton. The older, riot, older son moved into Brixton. You can only afford housing in places where there have been urban riots, so they can uh, go in there. The riots broke out in Tottenham. i have been writing and talking about the fact that the male life expectancy in Tottenham was 20 years shorter than in Kensington and Chelsea. The riots did not happen in Knightsbridge or outside Harrods. The riots happened in Tottenham. One government minister said, this is poverty pure and simple. To misquote Oscar Wilde, I think poverty is never pure and rarely simple. In fact, in Tottenham, 91% of the young people who were arrested in the riots were not in employment, education, or training. The national figure was 11%. Yes, 
The Daily Mail discovered that one rioter drove a VW Golf and parked it around the corner, and another one had a job, and that was evidence that this wasn't poverty. Well, the Daily Mail, never mind the Daily Mail. <laughs> I don't think that ill health causes urban unrest, and I don't think urban unrest causes ill health, at least not directly. I think they have common causes. That poverty of economic and social conditions, poverty of opportunity, all the things that you talked about in the session this afternoon. I like that slightly lively debate um, about whether how much it was poverty of money and other things, and it's both of those things. But they cause urban unrest and they cause ill health. And if we look in more detail, and this is what I do write about in the health gap, at Lashawn, growing up in Upton Druid, half a single parent families, median household income in 2010 was $17,000. Kids did poorly at school in reading, more than 50% missed at least 20 days of high school, 90% did not go on to college. Each year, a third of young people aged 10 to 17 were arrested for a juvenile disorder. Each year. Now, there would be some re-arrests, but what it means is the chance of a young person getting to the age of 17 in that part of town without an arrest is very small. And you know what that means for the rest of that young person's life. In 2005 to 2009, there were 100 non-fatal shootings for every 10,000 residents and nearly 40 homicides. I should say that part of the issue in Baltimore is the war on drugs. The war on drugs is the most disastrous social experiment that anybody ever dreamt. The police in Baltimore are rewarded for stopping young black men. And all the young black man needs to do is breathe to be stopped by a policeman. And they get, the cops get rewarded. The more arrests, the better they're doing. And they get time off to go to court. So they're stopping young black men all the time. The community relations, they've learned absolutely nothing. The community relations between people and the police are disastrous. Now, I don't think if they improve policing that all these problems would go away. It's still the underlying poverty of social and economic conditions. And here's Bobby in Roland Park, 93% two-parent families. Median household income is now not 17, but $90,000. 97% did well at reading, only 8% missed 20 days, 75% completed college. Remember, 90% did not go on to college in Upton Druid. And that's the end of my talk. Um, <laughs> how do I come back? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and each year, we're back at Lashawn, but where there's life, there's hope. Um, each year, one in 50 were arrested. One in 50, not one third, in... Roland Park, the young people stay out of the clutches, both of the police and the gangs. And in Baltimore, it could be hard to tell the difference. And there were no, no I didn't say that, and no non fatal shootings in 2005, 2010, and four homicides, one tenth of the homicide rate. Now, it's tempting to think that in the US, we're talking about deprived black communities. In Canada, we're talking about First Nation, excluded people. It's tempting to think this is just about the excluded. But it's clearly not just that. When 
wherever she is, when we were hearing about food insecurity earlier today, um, the clear message, sorry, there you are, um, the clear message was it's not just poor people, it's actually a social gradient. And here, US figures, the gradient by education, the life expectancy, white women, black women, white men, black men, the more years of education, the longer the life expectancy. And it is a big problem. This paper from Anne Case and Angus Deaton at the end of last year, looking at all-cause mortality, ages 45 to 54, France, Germany, UK, Canada, Australia, Sweden, coming down in all those countries. Big differences between France and Sweden. It's lowest in Sweden. But all those countries coming down. It's been coming down in US Hispanics. But look at the red line at the top. Oh, my God. It's been going up in US non-Hispanic whites. Dramatically so. And it stands out. I'm going to Washington tomorrow afternoon for a meeting at NIH about this very problem. What on earth is going wrong? Now, in fact, that rise is steeper the fewer the years of education. So the social gradient is getting steeper. Now, in the US, as you know, because they've got such a bizarre health care system, people think that inequalities in health are related to inequalities in access to the health care system. That's not this problem. What were the causes of death? Number one, poisonings due to alcohol and drugs. Number two, suicides. Three, chronic liver disease, alcohol, and then external causes of death. When Angus Deaton wrote to me about this, he said, we talk about it as an epidemic of despair. Well, I talk about it as disempowerment. And it's affecting the whole population worse the further down you are in the social gradient. This was figure one now updated, both in the Marmot Review, our 2010 review of health inequalities in England, and figure one in the health gap, but we've updated it. And it's looking at life expectancy and disability-free life expectancy for small areas of England. Each dot represents one small area classified by income deprivation. So to the right-hand end, as you look at it, is the least deprived, the most affluent. And people living in areas near the top have life expectancy a bit less than people in the very top. People in the middle, less than near the top. All the way from top to bottom. And there's a gradient in disability-free life expectancy, which is the bottom graph, that is steeper than the gradient in life expectancy. For disability-free life expectancy, the difference between the 5th and 95th centile is 17 years. And in trying to make the case that this is not just about the poor, I mean, think about what's your attitude to the poor? If you're of one political persuasion, you may think that the poor are architects of their own misfortune, feckless, worthless. What did Cindy say earlier today? The government doesn't value me because they don't want to spend money on me. You said it better than that, but, uh, but you know, valueless. You're not worth spending money on. So that's one attitude to the poor. They're not worth spending money on because they don't look after themselves. So you don't care about the poor. Or have another attitude, which is 
I do care about the poor. If the nature of society leads to people being poor and their health suffering as a result, I think that's very bad. But in your heart of hearts, you say, that's not me. Thank goodness that's not me. I think about the poor a bit like I think about the Siberian leopard. I don't know if there are any leopards in Siberia, but I'd be prepared to give $10 to help stop the Siberian leopard going extinct, and then on Thursday I'll get on and do something else. But the gradient means we've got to make common cause between people who are not poor and poor. If there's a 17-year gap in disability free life expectancy, it means the average person has eight fewer years of healthy life expectancy. Eight fewer years of healthy life expectancy means earlier onset of decline in grip strength, earlier onset of difficulty walking, earlier onset of decline in cog what's it called? Um, <laughs> cognitive function, <laughs> and of course fewer years of life. We have to make common cause. The poor are part of us, and we're part of the poor. We're all part of this society. That's what the gradient is telling us. And we use the phrase proportionate universalism, ugly phrase, but it means universalist policies with effort proportionate to need. And you know about gradients in Canada. When Americans say to me, why should I care? And I'm trying to make the gradient argument. And I say, because you're not doing very well on average. <clears throat> Imagine you're a 15-year-old boy, go into a school and count 115-year-old boys like you. 13 of you will die before your 60th birthday. Is 13 out of 100 a lot? Well, it's double the Swedish risk. It's higher than in just about every European country. It's higher than in Costa Rica and Chile and Cuba. Put that away. <laughs> in fact, in the US, it's higher than in 49 other countries. The US ranks 50th. It spends more per capita on health care, but on this particular measure, it ranks 50th. It's not simply a health care issue. If we think about the relation between wealth and health, the familiar Preston curve, this is plotting countries against GDP per capita at purchasing power parities, so adjusting for purchasing power. Uh, and on the y-axis, we've got life expectancy. What you can see at very low levels of national income, a small increase in income is associated with a big increase in life expectancy. For a country, if you haven't got any money, a bit of money makes a difference. Our colleagues in India say, 7% growth in GDP per year or 8% growth means they can do things now that they couldn't do before. So a bit more money makes a difference. It's not just national income. I was in Uzbekistan recently. I don't know if you can read that, but that's Kazakhstan, but Uzbekistan is the same. It's way below the line much worse health than you'd expect for their national income, doing much worse. And they have very bad social conditions and big inequalities. So it's not just about income, but at low levels of income, a bit more money makes a difference. But you remember I showed you LeSean in Upton Druid, household income, $17,000. $17,000, that puts him above Costa Rica, above Mexico. And yet, LeSean's life expectancy is about 12 years shorter than in Costa Rica, but he's much richer. Well, you've got to think about money in a context. 
is not just how much money you have, even adjusting for purchasing power. It's what it allows you to do. And if it doesn't, if you don't have the money to allow you to take your place in society, take your place in society without shame, then you are, relatively speaking, poor, impoverished. What do we do about it? We need to take action through the life course. Early child development, education, working conditions, older, older life. And then I have chapters here about communities. I began with chapter eight, chapter nine on society, and 10, the global perspective. Give every child the best start in life. When we published the report of the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, I drew attention to the fact that in Glasgow, in the area of Calton, male life expectancy was 54. And in Lindsay, it was 82, 28 year gap. And I was at a meeting in Brussels and a man came up to me with a lovely Scottish accent, if that's not a contradiction, <laughs> especially Glaswegian. And he said, I'm from Lindsay and I drink in a pub with a friend from Calton. And I thought privately, they wouldn't let people from Calton come to meetings in Brussels. You'd have to be from Lindsay. He said, the other night, I'm talking to my friend from Calton, and it turned out he'd made no arrangements for his pension. And I asked my friend, why not? He said, because I'm 54. <sighs> Oh dear. And I said, I'm delighted my research is being discussed in Glaswegian pubs. I hope in other places too. But the idea that this was destiny and that because he was 54, he didn't need to do anything about a pension because he wasn't going to live any longer was pretty heartbreaking. So Jimmy in Calton, a single mother, this case history was brought to me by... Detective Chief Superintendent who had a Damascene conversion. He was in charge of homicide. And he was asked, this is a cop, a senior policeman. He was asked, would you like another 100 police officers on the beat? And he said, no, I'd prefer 100 health visitors because of the importance of early childhood. This is a policeman with which I can do business. <laughs> and he told me about Jimmy. Single mother, she had had, the mother had a succession of male partners, each of whom abused Jimmy physically, if not sexually. They moved home every year or 18 months. By the time... Jimmy got to school, he was already labelled as having behaviour problems. As soon as he was old enough, he was known to the police. He never had a proper job. Any money he gets goes on drink and drugs, diet, if you can call it that, pub food, fast food and alcohol. Just imagine, here you are, a typical public health doctor or a well-trained family doctor, and you know what you've got to do is tell people not to drink and not to smoke and to look after your diet. Just a little thought experiment. You go to Jimmy and say, you know, Jimmy, you really should be eating proper diet and not drinking or doing drugs. I wish I could do a proper Glaswegian accent. But I can tell you the second word Jimmy would say to you would be off. <laughs> And if you were a libertarian and you said, Jimmy has the freedom to lead the life he wants, I'm sure it would be some comfort to Jimmy to know that some right-wing politician thinks that a life of anger, hostility, depression, drug abuse 
alcoholism, being thrown out by his girlfriends, and when he's not in prison, is what some right-winger calls freedom. If Jimmy had a secure upbringing, if Jimmy had good early child development and a good education, and then chose to sit under the Glasgow equivalent of the yum-yum tree, that's up to Jimmy. Then he does have the freedom to choose a life he has reason to value, but not with this tragic imprint of such a life. And his life expectancy is eight years shorter than the Indian average. And we see this more generally. This is looking at cognitive development, IQ if you like, from children followed from 22 months of age to 10 years of age. Look first at children who at 22 months were in the 10th, 10th centile of cognitive development. If they grew up in families of low socioeconomic status, they remain low. If they grow up in families of high socioeconomic status, they catch up. Now look at the other end. Children who at 22 months were in the 90th centile. If they grow up in families of high socioeconomic status, they remain high. There's regression to the mean, but that need not detain us. If they grow up in families of high socioeconomic status, they remain high. But if they grow up in families of low socioeconomic status, their relative ranking declines. Let me be really crude about this. If you're smart and poor, being smart's not good enough. The being poor takes over. If you're dumb and rich, just hang in there. <laughs> It'll come good. Assume for the moment that all the differences at 22 months are biologically determined. Genes. Things that happen in pregnancy. And that the differences associated with the socioeconomic position of the family are social. The social trumps... Oh dear. Did I say trump? <laughs> I've got to think of another word to say that. Um, the social outweighs <laughs> the social outweighs the biological. How can you talk about use a word like Trump when you're talking about social justice and health? But God, my nightmare is that Boris Johnson will become Prime Minister of Britain and deal with President Trump, and they <laughs> both could do with a good hairdresser. Um, <laughs> So the social circumstances in which children grow up is absolutely vital to their cognitive development. I work on the assumption that the big differences that we're seeing at 10 years of age are primarily social, not biological. Think about the discussion that we had in that brilliant session, if I may, the, the, second, the last part of the afternoon before we broke about is it income or other things. We've been monitoring early child development by local authority. This is the proportion of children age five that are classified as having a good level of development for every local authority in England, ranked by level of dep deprivation. It's part of the monitoring that we do. And what you can see is a straight line relation the more affluent the local authority, the higher the proportion of children age five that have a good level of development. But they scatter around the line. So, some people say it's poverty. And others say, no, no, for a given level of poverty, some areas are doing better than others. The government in Britain wanted to abolish income as a measure of poverty. They actually passed legislation in the House of Commons to say that the child poverty measured as less than 60% median income 
should no longer be a measure of poverty. We're going to measure poverty, they said, by broken families and uh, unemployed parents and one parent drug abuse or goodness knows what. They were wanted to... Draw. And uh, you've got to... You've got to be alive to the ironies. The House of Lords, colleagues, the House of Lords stopped the House of Commons. Their lordships were so outraged by the intellectual stupidity of doing this that their lordships sent it back to the Commons and said, to measure poverty, you've got to have money in there. God, the fact that we're actually, our democracy depends on the House of Lords. <laughs> That's where we've come to. Both are true. Two strategies. Reduce poverty. Bring the worst off, the most deprived, up towards the average. And will improve the quality of early child development. But... For a given level of poverty, good services make a difference. And in Britain, we've had sure start children's centres that have been closing. That's a very bad idea. Because good early child development, preschool services really make a difference. So whether you think it's poverty, I think you said that, Louise, whether you think it's poverty or good services, you're both right. Thank you. And can we do anything about the poverty? Well, yeah, we can, actually. This is looking at child poverty, defined as 60% median income in different countries before and after taxes and transfers. Compare Latvia with Sweden. Before taxes and transfers, the level of child poverty in Latvia was 35%, in Sweden was 32%. After taxes and transfers, in Latvia it was still up around 25%, in Sweden it was 12%, in Slovenia it was lower. Talk about health right across government, the Minister of Finance could probably make a bigger difference to children's well-being and development than the Minister of Health. It's not God-given or given by Darwin or whatever you subscribe to. Um, this is a political act to decide what the level of poverty should be. Latvia, the United Kingdom, we seem to quite like high levels of poverty in children. Well, the government didn't like it. That's why they were going to change the definition. Um, so they could no longer be hoist by this petard. But preschool makes a difference. What this graph shows for different Latin American countries is the proportion of children aged three to five enrolled in preschool. And you can see Cuba it's 100%. Costa Rica, Chile, it's very high. At the other end, Paraguay, Dominican Republic, Colombia, it's low. And then it shows reading scores in the sixth grade. The greater the enrollment in preschool, the better the reading scores in the sixth grade. It turns out that the countries with the best life expectancy are Cuba, Costa Rica and Chile, and the worst, Paraguay, Dominican Republic and Colombia. This is not proof, but it's consistent with a life course approach, high levels of enrollment in preschool, good school performance, better conditions in adulthood, and longer life expectancy. And this is not about wealth. These are not particularly rich countries. So I'm on both sides of that argument. <laughs> if you haven't got any money, money's quite helpful. But it's not just about money. They keep telling me to stop. So <laughs> you could, well, we can put it to the vote, I suppose. <laughs>
Anybody in the room who can tell me what intergenerational earnings elasticity is gets a drink of my water. Um, <laughs> this is looking at the resemblance of the income of adult children with the income of their parents. So for a country, if the income of adult children exactly resembles the income of their parents, that country would score one on this metric. So the US and the UK are quite high. And it, you think what that means. If the income of children exactly represents, resembles the income of parents, there's very little social mobility. So the US and the UK are not doing very well on social mobility. At the other end of the scale, if there's no relation between parents' income and the income of their adult children, a country would score zero. So Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden slip back a bit, have high levels of social mobility. Your parents' income is not determinative of your income. The problem is that that measure that similarity between parents' income and children's income, lack of social mobility, is correlated with the Gini coefficient of income inequality. The greater the income inequality of this generation, the less mobility. So that's a very complicated way of saying the greater the distance between the rungs of the ladder, the more difficult it is for the next generation to get from one rung to the next. Maximizing capabilities and control. That's a fancy way of talking about education. They're going to flash numbers at me in a minute if I go through all of this, so I won't go through all of it. But we know, I showed you a few moments ago, I, with the US and as, as an example, more years of education, better health. Education is good for your own health. Education is good for the health of your offspring. The single biggest contributor to the reduction in infant and child mortality globally has been education of women. Better than any other medical intervention, it's been education of women. So education is good for women's own health and it's good for the health of the next generation. That's infant mortality. It reduces fertility because it, women who are more educated can choose how many babies they want to have. And it turns out that in general, the more years of education in Bangladesh, women with secondary or higher education, 2.5 births per woman. In India, 2.1. In Ethiopia, two. More educated women are choosing to have fewer babies and putting more investment into the babies they have, they're more likely to survive. And look at this. The first lesson you're taught when you get involved in global health is to be culturally sensitive. Things are done differently in different countries. Surely, this is an example where the rights of women outweigh cultural sensitivity. The right of a woman not to be abused, to be treated as a citizen, has to, tr oh God, Trump, I was gonna say it again, <laughs> triumph over other considerations. So education is important for all those things. Fair employment and good work. I do want to show you this because when I was talking to you, I said that this relates to what you showed us about food insecurity. 13 million people in poverty. This is minimum income threshold, which is rather similar to the concepts that you were talking about and includes having enough money to have a healthy diet. The majority more than 50% of 
of households in poverty have at least one adult working. And in those households where at least one adult is working, three quarters of the adults were working. They are in poverty, not because they're feckless, not because, as some of our politicians say, they're shirkers, not because they don't want to work. They're in poverty because they're lowly paid. And that relates to ensuring a healthy standard of living. In 2010, in England, households with children, 31% were below the minimum income threshold. How much money you need to have a healthy life. In 2014, that 31% had gone up to 39%. I know you want me to stop, but you've got to allow me to have a rant. <laughs> this is a rant. And anybody who's a bit sensitive, close your ears. I guess there are no young people here, so it's okay. Because I'm going to say something really shocking. It's come to my attention very late in my life that not everyone in public life tells the truth. When the bishop says, I didn't do it, and the next day he's gone, and the cabinet minister says, I didn't ask my wife to pretend she was driving the car when it was speeding, and then he's gone. Well, we are being misled on a monumental scale. In Britain, the government's been telling us that we are the envy of the rich world. Our economy is the best. And you ought to keep voting for, and I'm not party political. But I am rather partial to people telling the truth, to not fibbing. And this is pants on fire stuff. <laughs> so we're the envy in Britain of the rich world. Look, 100 in 2007 is the average real wage, in, wage index for working people. By 2013, Australia had gone up to 109, Canada had gone up to 105, Germany had gone up to 109, UK, 92.9. And we're being told, and a biased press is echoing this garbage, that we're the envy of the rich world. Vote for us to get a secure economy. Now, the problem is, you've got to be some crazy nerd to look up the ILO Global Wage Database. How do we have a deliberative democracy when the people are being misled systematically? That's my rant. Rant over. Okay, you want me to finish, so I'm going to go on. <laughs> As Monique will remember, as Monique will remember, Monique was my great ally. Um, she was a member of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. And we launched the commission. We began in Santiago de Chile. And because it was in Chile, I quoted Pablo Neruda and invited colleagues to rise up with me against the organization of misery. And I said to my publisher, I wanted to call my book The Organization of Misery. And he said, you can't call a book The Organization of Misery. Nobody will read it. I said, well, can I call it The Organization of Hope? Better, but a bit obtuse. So I called it The Health Gap. But I did compromise, and chapter one was called The Organization of Misery, and I document the systematic, in systematic inequities in health between countries and within countries. But the last chapter, I called The Organization of Hope, because the evidence shows that we can make a difference really quickly. 
This is stunting by family income in Brazil. The top line is 1974 to 75, so slow growth in the first year of life. Steep gradient. 1989, the gradient's flatter. 96, it's flatter. By 2006, 7, you can scarcely see the gradient. We can make a difference really quickly. Oops. I was in Thailand in January for the reasons that I won't try and defend or explain. And I reminded my listeners that previous time I'd been in Thailand, the Thais talked to me about the triangle that moves the mountain. The three sides of the triangle are the people, government, and knowledge includes the academy. Get the three sides of the triangle aligned and colleagues, we can move mountains. Thank you.